All right, so thank you everybody for coming. Today is the second in a three-part series that Todd Davies is being kind enough to share with us. Um, oh, hold on. So for anybody who doesn't know, Todd Davies is the author of the History of Arcadia Visionary Fiction Series and the Jam Today Cookbook Memoir Series, as well as Editorial Director of Indie Exterminating Angel Press. And this is again, the second in our three part series. So Todd, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Newport Public Library and Laura Kimberly also as well. Catherine, we love librarians, do we not? Yes, we do. Yeah, Mike's going, yeah, no kidding, yeah. So um, I'm gonna move through my little bit fairly quickly um, because I want to get to Mike Madrid who is as some of you know he is the designer the creative director of exterminating angel press so he has designed all of the history of arcadia books as well as doing the illustrations for two of them for the two that i'm mainly going to talk about tonight i'll show you he did snotty saves the day he did lily the silent and the illustrations. He did The Lizard Princess and the illustrations. And I love this, so I have to show you. If you have all three of them together, he did the little EAP logo shows up, right? But more than that, I mean, we'll talk to him a little bit about illustration, but more than that, I also want to get his opinion about how visionary fiction actually functions in comics as well, because it's also true that in comic books, we see a lot of envisioning of new worlds, new ways of being. Um, and he has been the chronicler of that. He is in fact the expert about superheroines in the history of comics and what they have to do with American history um, and how they envision new worlds. So we're gonna get to that after I get through my little bit. Feel free to, to interact and say anything at any point and um, I, will, I will speak about that. Um, I'm going to talk Interestingly enough, today, um, Mackenzie Scott and her ex-husband have been in the news. I don't know how much everyone here has heard about that. Mackenzie Scott is this wonderful woman who is married to this ghastly guy who's like the richest man in the world. And the richest man in the world cheated on Mackenzie Scott. I think we all know this in a very embarrassing way. And she just was very dignified and wonderful about it and walked off with an enormous settlement. So she's the 19th richest person in the world. She married her, um, one of her children's teachers, I think it's his math, te math teacher. And she says that they are partners in giving away her fortune. So last year she gave away $8 billion to worthy causes, not million, 8 billion. Meanwhile, her ex-husband went up in a rocket today and made a big fuss about it and then said that the reason why he went up in the rocket was he was hoping we could move the heavy machinery um, from the earth up to the up to the other up to the outer space which is laughable that is never going to happen i think he just did that because he was thinking he was getting bad press because it just looked so much like a celebrity attention getting move which probably it was so Interestingly enough, that has to do with exactly what I was going to talk about tonight. Um, so I kind of threw out my outline, but uh, I will kind of stick to it and keep coming back to the two of them. So I'm going to start with something somebody said once um, about the Smithsonian Institute, the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. And I can't remember who said it, but it was terribly clever. They said that every single exhibit at the Smithsonian essentially was getting across one message. Things were bad, they're better now, soon they will be perfect. Now, I know some of you, that was true of all of our childhoods, was we really, we thought that, that we were simply on an, an arc heading upward, up to outer space, interestingly enough. Um, that has proved not to really be correct to look forward all the time, rather than looking back at things that might help us move forward, has not really been the best way to go. So for, for example, um, and Brian Griffith, who's joined us 
knows knows this better than I do because he wrote a fantastic book called The Garden of Their Dreams about a lot of where we came from originally. But also, I mean, look at 2500 BC in Crete. They had indoor plumbing, they had windows, they had, it was an incredible culture, which I think got, historians are pretty sure it essentially got done in by uh, environmental stresses, earthquakes, things like that, that then weakened the culture enough so that um, it, it was able to be taken over. And I mean, these kind of things have happened over and over. And Brian, in fact, has written another book about China, about a uh, galaxy of immortal women, about essentially five different empires in China rising and falling, but always keeping alive a vision of social equity in the stories that women were telling, especially in small towns and villages. Um, so that is a way of looking back to look forward having looked at those fairy tales, folk tales, legends, and keeping them alive, keeps alive a vision of social equity. So it's really funny because the, the um, Mackenzie Scott and Jeff Bezos conflict, if you will, is exactly what goes on in the two History of Arcadia books that I was gonna focus on. I mean, I'm not gonna talk about them too much, but in Lily the Silent, and in The Lizard Princess, both heroines try desperately to keep love going with partners who are more invested in individual glory than they are in mutual aid and harmony. And in fact, in The Lizard Princess, Sophia fails in her quest because she has to, she realizes that to succeed, actually she succeeds in it, but her partner fails because he at the last minute refuses to do it together. He insists on being the lone hero who then will um, get the key and disaster ensues. And she gets the key, but she has no partner at that point. So, and I'm moving on from that. And we'll talk about that the next time and report to Megalopolis, but it's essentially the same conflict that is going on watching Mackenzie, Mackenzie Scott and Bezos which is on the one hand, you've got a woman who is interested in mutual aid and harmony and community and in moving things forward that way. And on the other hand, you've got someone who's really interested in making an, a huge splash in the newspaper because he's been in a rocket. Did you see the picture of the rocket by any chance? I mean, it was unbelievable. The metaphor was, was actually embarrassing. I mean, it looked like a total, totally like a penis just going straight up. And I mean, it was very weird. It was like, could we, could we kindly calm down on the metaphors? I mean, at least keep it quiet, you know? So the choice pretty much is that there's a guy named Johann Hunzinger, who I think Brian probably knows really well, who wrote a wonderful book called The Waning of the Middle Ages. And he says that Western culture had a choice, has, a, has had a choice that's it's oscillated between, between what he calls the bucolic and the heroic for centuries. And bucolic is kind of a silly sounding word, but what he meant by bucolic was essentially community life, mutual aid, harmony, versus the individual triumphing, dominating, and authority. And there's a lot to be said for the heroic view, but if it goes too far without the bucolic view being integrated with it, um, you get a cancer, essentially. So if you look if you look back at the bucolic, right? Um, there's a lot of fiction. I mean, a lot of fairy tales are about this struggle. A lot of visionary fiction. My own is about that. Every one of the history of Arcadia books is about the struggle between the bucolic and the heroic. And of course I'm on the side of the bucolic. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of wonderful stuff about the heroic and it gets in there, but when it's out of control, it's not doing the culture any good. Ursula K. Le Guin writes quite a lot of fiction like this. The, the word for the world is forest, she wrote. Um, that's a wonderful version of that. So I wanna just talk about the three ways that you can look back to look forward because there are three ways that I immediately come to my mind. One, you can look back at stories of past human history that help in the future. There are a lot of examples of this, you know, obviously religious books, um, which can be too dogmatic, but which people use to 
move forward by reading something that happened in the past, but also myths like the King Arthur myth. Um, King Arthur and Merlin show up a lot in Western culture. They keep popping up at specific times. Um, the original grail, which we still have as a living symbol, was probably a Celtic fertility symbol originally, which is you know lost in the back back a ages of time. Um, and we were reworking it all the time. You've got Mary Stewart redoing it, T.H. White, Tennyson, and you know William Blake. Look at William Blake looking at all of the different um, the different symbols of the past in order to do visions, which we still haven't caught up with. A lot of what William Blake has to say, we still haven't caught up with. And also I was talking to Tim about Charles Williams. I don't know if anybody knows Charles Williams, but he was one of the Inklings and he writes fantastic books, which um, very few people seem to know about anymore. The Place of the Lion, uh, that's a good one for your color, your world summer and uh, the greater trumps. The Place of the Lion is a story about, and Laura Roman will like this, if you've never read it, Laura. Um, it's about Oxford. It's about Oxford academics who only think about symbols as actually being not living things, you know, or things to move their careers ahead. But then they come to life with horrific implications for the Oxford dons who have brought them to life. Um, and they rampage through a, a lion, a, the great lion rampages through the, the dove, the Holy Spirit appears and rampages through Oxford. It's that you'd love it, Laura. It's a fabulous book. Um, Tolkien uses Scandinavian sagas. Dante, of course, uses old symbols to move things forward. So that's the first way. And that's the way that we that we know the most, that we think about the most. The second way to look back, to look forward, is by investigating our own personal histories. Um, how our traumas have formed us. Because if you haven't lived your trauma and experienced it, you will keep reenacting it. And this is true of cultures, not just of people because people make up cultures. So in a lot of ways, we are still reenacting traumas that have happened in our past history. Proust, curiously enough, is a great, uh, great example of someone who looks back to look forward in this way because his entire, I mean, I seem to be the only person who thinks remembrance of things past is one long fairy tale, but it, it really is. It's a long fairy tale and it's also about how the past creates your future. Um, and you have to go back into your past in order to understand who you are and in order to move forward. I mean, I love those books. They're really great. But this leads me to what I consider the most important mode of looking back to look forward um, and one that, that all of us can participate in and do, I hope. That's to look back beyond, beyond our own unconscious into what makes us human. It's what the I Ching calls the inexhaustible wellspring of the divine in human nature, that everyone can go down to that well and find out what our beginnings are in the divine. Um, it's the descent into the other world. It's, it's, it's the stories that take you into, fairy, into some parts of fairyland. It's Goethe's The Realm of the Mothers that he talks about in Faust. Um, it's where creative beings get their, get their motive and get their energy. It's, this has always been symbolized in fairy tales and legends over and over. And I, I think in comic books too, in some comic books, there's a Gnostic, there's one particularly beautiful book that I wanted to bring up that really gets into this, which is, it's called, it's a Gnostic hymn called The Pearl and it's the story of the son of the greatest king and queen of the universe. And they send him in disguise down to Egypt to steal the great pearl that they have there. But when he gets to Egypt, he eats their food. Like this is like Persephone in Hades. He eats their food and he wears their clothes and he forgets who he is. He forgets that he is a king. He forgets that he's a prince and he forgets what he's supposed to do. And it's an incredibly touching story because all of us have that feeling of having forgotten something. Who, who am I? What happened? And that's in the history of Arcadia, 
all the characters are continually being reborn as different characters. And like, I vaguely remember when I was a unicorn and Snotty saves the day. But wait, no, that can't really have been happening. And yet it is happening because they are living through reenactments and they're living through trying to solve the same problems. And essentially they're trying to solve the problem of how to evolve as, as humans over and over again. So, and I personally think that unicorns and fairies and angels help us with that. So they're all over the history of Arcadia. You know? It's the story of the prodigal son too, essentially. Mm. So it's all, it's all in art. It's in experiencing art and creating art. What we're doing all the time is seeking the answer to the question, who am I? What am I doing here? What is it best for me to do? So with that, I would like to bring Mike Madrid into the conversation. Um, Mike, would you, shall we start with comics or should we, let's start with the illustrations with how, how you dealt with the illustrations in History of Arcadia and what you felt about them and about designing the book and about looking backward because for example, in Snotty Saves the Day, I was delighted when you brought the first book, the first, the first um, attempt at, not, it wasn't even an attempt, but what you wanted to do with the design. And it was like the book of knowledge that I had had as a child. Did anybody else have those books of knowledge? Ooh. They were fantastic. They were fantastic. <laughs> yeah, they were fantastic. They weren't really an encyclopedia because it wasn't, um, it was kind of chaotic. Every book had like an essay about, I don't know, cornfields in Kansas. And it, every book had a fairy tale. Every book had, but there were 30 of them. And he designed Snotty Saves the Day so that it looks like a book of knowledge. And what made you, what made you do that? Well, um, as you recall, you had, you had gotten started, before we started working together, you had gotten started working on Snotty Saves the Day. You had had um, that illustrator, Gary Zabley, do those drawings. Um, and they were really like classic children's book illustrations. Like, like there are not that many illustrators that would still work that way anymore. Fine lines, very detailed. Um, I wouldn't say old fashioned, but just really a classic illustration style that you don't see that much anymore. And it was great. Uh, but I remember when we were talking about the first three books and you and I both had a, um, you and I both and I had grown up with the book of knowledge and had a fondness for those. Um, but I remembered we talked about the first three books and I asked you what the, kind of what the feeling of each one was. And you said, um, Snotty was about childhood, uh, that Lily the Silent was about adolescence and that the Lizard Princess was going to be about um, moving into adulthood. Uh, and that gave me the, uh, that sort of gave me the framework for what the three books should look like and that they should look distinctly different. So since for Snotty, we had those illustrations that were like classic children's fairy tale uh, illustrations, I really went with that. So I went with a very old fashioned kind of looking book. Uh, a lot of the details um, were very sort of like an old fairy tale book that you would find in an old library or in an old um, bookstore. Uh, down to, um, I did a different version of the Exterminate Angel logo for each book that went with, um, with, that, uh, with that style. And we were also, I was also kind of progressing through the early 20th century. So the look of that book was kind of Victorian. Um, when you went to Lily the Silent, which you described as being at its heart a romance, and it has um, a female protagonist, uh, and it's about adolescence, and it's about um, sort of that innocence of adolescence when you're when you're very optimistic about this person that's supposedly going to be the great love of your life, and you're going into it sort of maybe with blinders on. Anyway, I wanted it to be have a romantic feel. Uh, so I went with an Art Nouveau design for that since it was very feminine, a lot of, you know, Art Nouveau, there was a lot of, you know, rounded feminine shapes. And what I tried to do with the illustrations was kind of a sort of an updated, um, sort of an updated 
Aubrey Beardsley style. Uh, and it really looks like that. And also, I just want to add that it was also, I would, in writing it, I was referring to the King Arthur legends and the way that King Arthur, mm -hmm. that that comes across. And Mike, Mike really illustrated that. And you yes. did the illustrations to that too. So, um, so that was the, <clears throat> the kind of feeling of that, but it was also, you know, there's also sort of science fiction, um, overtones to it. So it's kind of an Aubrey Beardsley style, you know, reminiscent of that, very black and stark black and whites. But then um, you've got sort of science fiction elements in some of the illustrations. And then for the third one with Lizard Princess, it was um, a little bit about disillusionment, a little bit about sort of leaving those, um, leaving those childish kind of dreams behind when you're faced with stark re harsh reality am i is that am i saying that right um definitely all right and um and about moving into adult yeah What's if you're that? gonna be a queen you better face, if you're gonna be a queen you better face the harsh realities that was yeah what her you know story says you know the thing is what you know live in the silent was really sort of like a fairy tale kind of a fairy tale world um the third one it's that world with um kind of with glasses on where you so see you're actually seeing it what it's like and it's a little bit um it's a little and some of like it's a little worse for wear in the sense that some of the people that were really doing well in that second book or have seen better have sort of fallen on hard times so uh i wanted the look of that book to be harder um and i went with sort of a um i had gone to berlin on vacation and um i wanted to have sort of a 1930s, like pre-war, 1930s Germanic look, a little harder. I even designed a harder, um, a harder exterminating angel logo, that, that skull with the wings. Um, but I wanted to go with a sort of an art deco look that um, that was just was a little bit more realistic and um, really just more mostly portraits of the different people versus scenes and um, just a little colder overall, like a, like that world is getting a little colder because um, the protagonist is seeing it in maybe in a more realistic way. Um, and, and then, then we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I, but tell me a little bit about Report to Megalopolis. Well, Report to Megalopolis, Megalopolis um, we were playing around with, kicking around ideas of sort of things from that world. And I mean, because we had, We'd really, we'd really um, explored most of those stories from the viewpoint of the of people from Arcadia uh, versus we didn't really, um, except for their brushes with Megalopolis, we didn't really uh, explored that world so much. Um, so uh, I went a little harder still with that, uh, and you and I was playing off that the idea that you were uh, you told me a lot that it was like a like a um, revisiting of Frankenstein. So I went with that, like a darker feel with that. And then Todd and I both have a, um, uh, uh, are both fond of tarot cards and everything to do with tarot cards and tarot card readings and the history of those cards and all that stuff. So um, what I did was I designed the Arcadian version of tarot cards, sort of like if they, you know, if they had something like tarot cards in there in that world, what would they be? But all of the cards were um, referred to um, events that are in the book uh, and themes that are in the books like rebirth and knowledge and um, uh, sort of different things that, you know, because there's this, the Todd was talking about how there is, um, there's always this rebirth and that the, the you know, we have the different characters that we you meet throughout the books uh you see them in different forms so there's maybe the manatee in the in in the first book that is, is reborn as something else in the second book um what i wanted to do was the idea that there would be these like their equivalent of tarot cards in that world but the cards actually show some of the events of the characters that we've seen but those events from their lives have become part of their um, uh, their heritage and kind of their part of their folklore, uh, even though the people in that world may not even know it. So- um, Just like us. Just like us, yeah. 
So, um, so that was the idea with um, that was the idea with those cards for the for the third one. I had a lot of fun doing those. And once again, thank God that there are things in the in the um, uh, thank God that there are things in the public domain because I was able to rework a lot of um, those images from that writer deck uh, and kind of reinvent them uh, for um, it for our cards, which is great. So, so this is this might be the time to say that I actually wanted to rename the third um, in this series and call it uh, "Vision Visions of the Future," uh, and we will talk about the fourth book that Mike just talked about, "Report to Megalopolis," as well as um, introduce Colby Elliott, who is here with us today, who is Last Word Audio, who has done the wonderful, and I cannot say this enough wonderful narrations for audiobooks of Snotty Saves the Day and Report to Megalopolis. And also he has done The Supergirls. He, uh, that was the first of his audiobooks for Exterminate Angel Press. He did Mike Madrid's The Supergirls um, and wonderfully. So we're gonna, we're gonna make him talk next time, but because this might be a good transition. Wait, first I have to say, hi, Steve. Good to see you, Steve Scholl. Hey, hon, down there. Hi. Gosh, everybody's here. I'm so, um, <laughs> so Mike, could we move on to comic books? Of course. Did you... I'm almost always happy to talk about that. I know, and I didn't warn you I was going to ask you about this, but it occurred to me after I said, would you come on and talk about the illustrations, that of course, visionary fiction has got lots of expression in the comics. And as I said last in the last section, that children's books are looked down upon and they shouldn't be because it's whether they are containing this idea of who am I, where am I going, what kind of world can I make, what are the new worlds, that's visionary. It doesn't matter what genre it's in. And of course, that's always true in comic books. And Tim's got his hand up. So go, I'm Tim. Just gonna, but... I just have to throw something in because it's so perfect. You brought up Johann Wazinga earlier in that waning of the Middle Ages. He also wrote a book that had a tremendous influence on me called Homo Ludens, which is all about human beings as players. And that the culture, he identifies culture in its highest and some of its most practical ways as play. So when you're making that pitch for children's literature, and I love that you guys did this. I mean, it is so came so cool, Mike, that you did like the old books of knowledge that have that sense both of the past and of childhood for these books, which are clearly over brimming with these deep things that are again, often dismissed as childish. I just had to pop that in, sorry. <laughs> it's interesting, and you know, those, uh, you know, and Todd, Todd will probably, agree with me on this, those books of knowledge still stay with me. I mean, we had we had a set of those. And I mean, there's so much, um, I, I'm a big lover of, I, I'm a big lover of art. I'm a docent at the, at two of the museums here. And what my big, I, I would say one of the reasons for my, my love of art is being exposed to art in those book of knowledge books. And there's still times when I'm, you know, somewhere in the world and I will go to a museum. It's like, oh my gosh, there is that there is that painting, there's that statue that I'm getting to see in, in person for the first time that I saw when I was 10 years old in one of those books. And it's just, you know, those books I had were probably from the 1930s, but um, they, they just, you know, that's, that's where I was introduced to uh, Greek mythology, which I love so much. And it kind of marries with my love of comics. Uh, and it's just, they, they were such a, those, those books were incredibly, um, uh, influential to me, which is why I was so happy that it was yet another thing that Todd and I both uh, shared a love for. We do. And I still have my, I have the entire collection. I, uh -huh. I inherited them. My brothers didn't get them. Mm -hmm. uh, did, Brian, do you have your hand up or are you just scratching your forehead? Brian, Griffith, <laughs> did you want to say something or are you just thinking? Brian? Okay, I think I'm off mute. Mute. No, I'm I'm taking notes. I'm sorry. I'm winning <laughs> and taking notes. It's good well, stuff. Your hand went up, so I thought maybe you wanted to talk. You know, it's like uh, the, it's like being in an auction. Don't put your hand up unless you want to. Uh, sorry, sorry, got you the wrong impression. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. 
Okay, so so one of the things, this is funny because actually, let me tell the anecdote about how Mike and I got together, which was when I started Exterminating Angel Press, I wanted it to be about stories that questioned the dominant cultural story of dominance, hierarchy, and authority. And a friend of ours, a mutual friend, said, oh, I have a friend who wants to write a book about the superheroine in American comics. And I said, give me his phone number right now. I'm going to talk to him. So I called him and Mike starts pitching it to me. And I said, don't even pitch it. Just start writing it. And after about, I don't know, maybe it was a year, Mike said, he kept saying, I don't understand why you want to do this. You're not interested in comics. And then after about a year, he went, oh, I get it. I understand why you want to do this book. And then we did it, and it has been always the most successful of the Exterminating Angel Press books because there was no other book like it. And that's, I knew there wasn't, exactly. I knew there wasn't because I had been hearing from everyone. One of the, re one of the things I heard when I was writing Snotty from people was, don't write a female protagonist because little girls will read male protagonists, but little boys won't. And I was like, well, that's the reason why I'm writing Snotty. So no, 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 that's not going to happen. And the other thing I would hear was little girls don't read comics. And I knew that wasn't true because I had read comics. Laura read comics. Laura was very into them. Um, I imagine Colby's daughters are really into them too. And so I knew there was no other book like the Supergirls. So I knew it was going to do really well. And sure enough, being taught everywhere now. So let's talk a little bit about visionary fiction and comics, Mr. Madrid. Well, um, you know, after, and I'm, I'm not, I won't get into this too much, but, you know, after the last um, four years in this country, um, you know, things that are considered American are not always viewed with the best in the best light. But for me, um, you know, there's, I have my own idea of sort of, um, what um, the best of America is. And for me, that's all about optimism and optimism and opportunity and the opportunity to, um, to you know, uh, reach your dreams and, and become, uh, sort of become the, you know, become the, you know, reach, you know uh, become the person that you were meant to be in a sense. And uh, to me in the, that's what comics are about. They're sort of about everyone, the, you know, people that get, an opportunity to become the best version of themselves, whether they are coming, you know, whether it's like Superman coming from another planet, but embracing these, you know, American values of truth, justice, uh, and using those powers to help others, um, or whether whether it's someone who, you know, somehow gets some kind of some kind of um, powers, and then they use that to help others. That's sort of the so sort of that American ideal, and that's what um, comics were first. That's really what they were about, because before they got really cynical. Um, and you know, I, you know, if it, you know, it, it makes sense that those early comics were all created by um, the sons of immigrants, because they were they came from this background where they had all come from some other place, probably Europe, uh, and they came to America to have a better life. So these guys whose parents had, you know, started new lives for their families, they were just taking that idea and running with it. And, um, you know, saying, what's the sort of, what's the, the biggest expression of that idea? What's, you know, if you really could, if you could become the best, the best version of yourself and help the world, what would that look like? Um, and, you know, it's, it's, in a sense, it's like our modern mythology. It's like, you know, all these other countries, all these other cultures have their legends and have their folklore. Um, America, because, um, you know, or rather, you know, America, the United States, um, I'm not, I, don't, I don't mean Native Americans, but, you know, America, you know, the United States doesn't really have a folklore because it's, you know, this composite of all these different cultures. But in a sense, uh, comic books, you could say that they are our mythology. And in the sense uh, that you, you were saying that um, children's books are looked down on, it's interesting now for, for someone like me who's read comics all their life and, you know, I had to one time be sort of embarrassed about, you know, being an adult that read comics. And now it's like, every, you know, 
the world, you've, you, if I know a lot of my friends who read comics also feel like the world's kind of caught up with us because now everyone reads them. Everyone goes to see these movies and everyone's embracing these stories and kind of seeing, I think what, um, I think they're seeing that sense of optimism that um, or is at the heart of those stories and embracing them. Um, oh, but the one of the- the sense of hope. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the things that I mentioned very early on in Supergirls was that you have this world where really anything is possible. Um, you know, people can fly, people can live under the water, people can fly through, you know, live, you know survive in the, you know, airless uh, outer space. Yet at the same time, there's this double standard where it's like men get to do all these things, but then the women are never or rarely given the opportunity to be as powerful. So there are women always have some kind of something that kind of holds them back from being equals with those men. And it, I, when I was a kid, I used to think, well, why is the Scarlet Witch, why can she only like have like one do one blast in the, like in the, in the Avengers, she does like, she did, you know, does one thing and then she's weak and then she passes out. And the other, and the guys have to like help her and rescue her while they're fighting the bad guys. I thought, why is it, if you have this fantastic world, why can't it just be even? Um, and that is a lot of what I talk about in the, in the, in the books, uh, because it is, I mean, it's getting better in comics now, but it's still, it's still a thing. And it's, it's like, it's it's a it's a, in that strange way, comics are a reflection of our world. You know, there are very few writers who are unwilling to say, um, "We're going to just let go of all of the conventions of our world and just think about something fantastic." It happens, and it, you know, and it it, it it's, oddly enough, it happened in the very early comics, in those very early ones that that you know, like some of the ones that came out in 1940. You had these very, you had this flowering of these very fantastic characters that were female characters that were just incredibly powerful and were as powerful as men, if not stronger. But it's this very small little time, little moment. Um, and then kind of harsh reality came in. And then, you know, World War, uh, 1941, World War I start, World War II starts, and comics had to be sort of serious and refocus their attention on being propaganda and fighting the war. And then women had to be helpless and they, or they had to be um, pretty, or they had to, you know, they had to be pinups for the soldiers and they couldn't be strong because it wasn't attractive anymore. They had to be an audience for yeah. the, for the males at that point, yeah. um, which, which had not been true, which had not been true before. And which is exactly what, we're talking about in the split that Hunziger talks about between the bucolic and the heroic, mm -hmm. which is the women and women weren't allowed to be superheroines in the trait of care for the elderly and children, for example. I mean, why should that be looked down on when it looks when it's looked upon that it's a great thing to like take somebody's head off, you know, or hit them with a ray with an electric ray? Why isn't mutual aid considered as a superpower? Um, why is woman's world that Wonder Woman comes from? Why doesn't that get more play? Yeah. And Mike, Mike's really good on Wonder Woman. Boy. Uh, it's funny because I, there's one thing I, me I mentioned something in the, in the intro of Supergirls, which a lot of people ask me about and, and have remarked on, which is uh, this, well, this idea. And I have never, I've not really asked my, I've not really explored this with my mom, but my mom, when, when I was growing up, we never, we rarely watched um, war movies or Western movies because my mom used to say, well, it's just men. And if there's just, if there's no women in a story, nothing can happen. Uh, and I didn't really quite understand that when I was a kid. I, I used to think, well, I used to, you know, I, you know, growing up when I, you didn't see a lot of, you know, in the sixties, you didn't see a lot of powerful women. And I thought, well, maybe it means like the, the women have to um, be sort of the the catalyst or like they have to be like the thing that gets rescued or something like that. So like in that sense, nothing can happen because there's women, you know, um, sort of elevate the danger of situations. But then I realized as I got older and, and traveled through life, it's like, yeah, nothing can happen because just a bunch of guys is boring. It's like, there's just, it's, there's nothing, you know, nothing. And that's one of the reasons that I always liked 
um, the female characters is, is that the men always had to be pretty one dimensional. They had to be strong and they had to be fearless, but they were never allowed to show any emotions. And even if the women were not as strong, they seemed like um, more developed characters because they, they were able to have um, sort of a psychological life, you know, and, and actually be um, real, like real characters that had, you know, hopes and fears and, and, and vulnerability. And that's what made them seem, that's what's made them seem more weird, more interesting to me. And that does make them more interesting. That makes them more human. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions or, or comments? Normally, um, last time you guys were so talkative. Oh, Brian. Yeah. Um, I wonder in, in comic books, do, do you feel that they're kind of spreading out beyond you know, being stories of vigilante heroes to, you know, some kind of visionary, more visionary fiction that has a kind of bucolic thing to it? Not so much in this country. I think that's what, I mean, that's one of the things that uh, definitely Japan has that a lot more. Uh, and there is one of the reasons that manga got to be so popular, especially in the last 20, 25 years uh, with younger readers is that there is a bigger breadth of subject matter in those. So it's not just all people fighting. You know, it's not, there is a lot more, um, it's different kinds of stories, including just sort of slice of life stories, but told in, uh, you know, graphic, uh, in that graphic format. Uh, and that's what, that's why a lot of younger people like, like, um, manga because it, it, it gives you more options. Uh, one of the things that we've seen in the last, I'd say the last 10 years or so, uh, because the industry has been sort of struggling with this idea that um, of trying to attract more female readers is that they have been trying to tell more sort of different kinds of stories with their characters. Uh, that's not just the basic um, people fighting because like when, you know, Todd was saying like people, people always say, um, people don't, you know, girls don't read comics and they do. And then one of the things that came out of me writing these books is that I've heard from a lot of women and young, young women who, who really like comics and they, um, but they, a lot of them just don't like what's out there, which is just people fighting, you know, they want something else. And the industry, as they've been hiring more female writers, They've been trying to um, tell more stories that are just not just the vigilante kind of thing like you were talking about. They're trying to use, show those characters in different kinds of situations that uh, telling different kinds of stories. Uh, and um, you know, some of it's good, some of it's not, I mean, for me, some of it's good, some of it's not, not as good, but it's, it's a way that, the, that that genre is growing and developing. So so one of the things that really seems to me to be happening, especially in the present emergency, I mean, I think we've all got to agree that we're in a present emergency. Um, and I see, I didn't realize that this was Chris Farrago down here, a wonderful poet, by the way, who deals with the emergency in wonderful ways, in quite elliptical ways. Nice to see you, Chris. Nice to meet you. Oh, um, glad to meet you. I did. Thanks. And <laughs> well, you see, you know, I love you. I mean, I'm always, we put like two of your poems in practically every single issue. Um, and Marissa, by the way, our poetry editor, Marissa Beltoffoli wanted to come on tonight so that she could meet any of the poets as well. Um, but she has childcare issues, so she may be on the next one. And then David Horowitz here, who's also here, writes wonderful essays dealing on a very, uh, very everyday um prose form about the present emergency, which is why I publish an essay of him in every issue, because they are always very straightforward for values that get too often pushed aside as not being romantic enough, you know? So one of the things that I have really noticed, the culture seems to be shifting quite radically right now, but I mean, we'll wait and see what happens because I don't think this emergency is gonna end anytime soon, unfortunately, is there's the end of the hero the end of the concept that there is one lone individual who is going to save the day who then will triumph. 
um, and Brian Griffith and I have back and forths about this all the time on email. Uh, he's doing a book that's, I think, gestating right now, so I'm not entirely sure what it's about yet, but kind of, we've been talking an awful lot about the concept of the hero. And one of our big, um, one of the people that we love is Joseph Campbell, who wrote, um, what's the hero book called? The Thousand, the thousand, thousand Faces. Yeah, it's Thousand Faces hero. of the Hero. Thousand Faces, right. So I started to reread it the other day. It really reads dated. And I mean, I read it five years ago and I didn't read dated. And I read it now and I'm thinking, oh, this is like from, I don't even know, from the 19th century. Because it's all he, the hero, he. Women are there to admire the hero. Women are there to give boons to the hero. Women are there to grant things for the hero. Women are never there as the hero, ever. Now, honestly, and I remember saying once to a neighbor, why is it we only have one leader? Why don't we have couples for a leader? Why don't we have a, ma a married couple to be the president? And she said, well, you couldn't do that. And I said, why not? And she couldn't tell me, <laughs> but we couldn't do it because there's no story. There's no story for it. Tim. I have, I have to throw in an example here that is just unbelievably perfect for what you're talking about. You know, one of the reasons I'm such a follower and creator of stories, why I'm so committed to story, is that there is this, it seems to me you can actually have a great deal of faith in this aspect of the human mind and heart and how it operates. And there's always a marketplace for stories, just like there is for ideas. Some stories catch on, some don't. It depends on the time, the people, the culture, all that kind of thing. But there is that constant, inexhaustible bubbling up. And what again and again happens is that it, I, I think it, I almost never make absolute generalizations, but I think it might be impossible to find a culture where people are not creating, changing, or shifting stories to deal with what the hell's happening to them right now. So I cannot imagine a better text, and especially we're talking, Mike's talking so uh, in such a specific way about comic books. Well, the other great folk form of stories in our time is movies, TV, and video in general. And one of the things, and of course, we've talked many times already, Todd, you and I alone in emails and on, on this about this whole dismissing of or devaluing of literature or anything stories for younger people. Uh, you guys probably know this, but there is some shit happening in the world of children's animated movies that is blowing me away. Now, a lot of kids animated movies are, I like them, they're typical. Um, so I just finished watching the two Incredibles movies by Brad Bird. I cannot recommend them highly enough as an adult to other adults. These oh, are good. superhero movies. Okay, so here's what's happening in the second one. The First of all, the, it's a family of superheroes. It's not just a man. His wife is Elastic Girl. By the way, that's put in ironically. He's Mr. Incredible, and the kids are growing up. And these movies are stories about family, about kids going through childhood and adolescence, about the husband and wife trying to work on a marriage. And your point about the heroes, Todd. In this world, heroes, superheroes have been outlawed. So they're trying to find a way to be superheroes in a world where they're outlawed and it brings up all these rich things, all these rich tensions and back and forth. On it. Right now, in, in the, I, I'm in the second viewing of, of Incredibles 2. In the middle, the husband is staying home, which as a man who stayed home with my kids, I find more, I more than appreciate it, right? It is a paradigm shift when men start taking domestic responsibility in the home. The wife is getting the light shown on her as a superhero, and the movie is presenting very honestly how jealous he is. But what they keep coming back to is this family does best when they act together. But the level of honesty, in the first movie, there are even scenes where, forgive me because I'm so excited about these, there are even scenes where the husband and wife are shown, by implication, enjoying sex with each other as their marriage gets revitalized. This isn't a movie for children. Now, the second that human beings Take the, yes, the second that human beings take up a pen, which means we can make a line, take whatever shape we want, or a paintbrush, that's when artifice steps in. And artifice is this key, this place that lets all of these things that we're going through, whether we, we know it or not, bubble up. And I, I just, I can't say enough about how these issues are being presented in a hugely fun chase scene, bombs blowing up, but actually 
family values, gender values. It's amazing. So, so, so it is happening. I, I, now I want to really watch these movies. And I, I have to say Coco is another example of this. Coco is an example of a movie that is actually about the, the heroic versus the bucolic. And the heroic is actually a prop. I mean, he actually is a murderer and a He's thief terrible. and a horrible person. Yeah. Um, this is maybe a moment, it may also be a moment to talk about nonfiction that is kind of like that. I mean, Henry Adams wrote The Dynamo and the Virgin mm -hmm. about the two separate ways, the two motives that had moved Western culture forward. Um, the, the Virgin having, as he pointed out, having actually motivated greater structures than the dynamo ever had, right. even though America had forgotten about the Virgin and was going with the dynamo. And we have a journalist with us tonight who is fighting for local journalism and local journalism, once again, local journalism is on the side of community, on the side of family, on the side of interactions, as opposed to mass media, which seems to be taking over right now. But as the spiral goes, probably will not. Probably the local journalism will have a resurgence. And I think Bert was showing me that there is a new network of what looked to be mainly young women in different towns who are trying to revitalize local journalism. Is that right? Was I right about that, Bert? Or are you muted? You're muted, aren't you? Unmute yourself. Live, journalist, live. There, you. there, there you are. Yeah, so was I right about that? Is there now a network of young women who are trying to revitalize local journalism? I don't. I don't think it was gender specific, but uh, now that you mention it, I. I oh, I, women! I sure. they, they were mostly women. <laughs> I was kind of blind to that, but um, there's, yeah, there, there, there's. I, I, I'm glad you brought in that the journalism as part of storytelling because I've been blessed with exposure to a number of editors who talk mm -hmm. about that as the. Uh, really what ties everything together is the storytelling aspect of it. So, um, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, the, uh, boy, I've been in this for a while. I, I would say in the last 10, 15 years, there's been even more of a thing about, of the many voices that uh, journalism doesn't represent that uh, the, the gender is, a, is among them. <laughs> there's, you can tick them off pretty, pretty good, but. Uh, yeah, there's, there's great progress in, in a lot of ways in that. It really does seem like there is a, there's a, a huge upheaval happening everywhere right now. Um, what are the Chinese, the Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times? It's a curse, right? That's a curse. May you live in interesting there, times. And we another formulation is there's great, right there's great disorder under heaven and the situation is excellent. <laughs> yeah, because also, <laughs> There is a possibility. There are all the possibilities of the green shoots then, um, which I have to say is the moment I've been waiting for. And we have another publisher here who can probably speak to this too. Steve, since you've been living through, you moved to Austin and the next thing you know, Austin had the most incredible winter in history. And what else, do you see any green shoots happening in story, Steve? Steve, Steve actually is also a scholar of, um, Islamic literature. Um, so, I uh, <laughs> I get more and more pessimistic every day. I'm having real <laughs> trouble. I'm having really trouble finding the green shoots. I I got to tell you, um, but it is you know. I mean, I think that's where hope lies. You know, is uh, you know, you've you've kind of caught me in a in a emotionally downward spiral here with moving to texas um two mass shootings since i moved here you know i mean it's just like i i'm i'm a <laughs> i'm a i'm a left coast boy who's struggling with my new environment uh and seeing any uh any anything good at all going on around me here in blue austin so but Thank God you're in Austin. Yeah, thank God I'm in Austin. Yeah, so, but it's still, I mean, I mean, the the, the shootings were here in Austin. 
you know, and there's, uh, oh my God, anyway, get me off of that topic. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. No, because I never, I just, we always have hope as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I am, I am, I am like, a, the glass is half full, live with it. Okay. I'm that kind of person. I'm the person coming up behind you when you're complaining and saying, think of the nice things because that drives my husband crazy. My husband, my husband is not just a glass is half empty person. He is the fascist boot of capitalism is stomping on the glass too. And I'm like, that might be true. That might be true. But then there's another glass over here, you know, and that is also why the press and why the history of Arcadia books um and also yeah. why the jam today yeah. books because the jam today books hey conch how are you doing i just saw somebody else come on the jam today books are, are cookbook memoirs um and really they are about encouraging people to enjoy their lives because i really do enjoy mine i mean in the midst of wildfires and weather and terror you do and the and the, the and the the jackboot of fascism like overhead right now sort of so but but that is as tim and tim's got his hand up so i bet i was just going to say as tim was saying that's an opportunity so I, the, the, no that's a perfect segue I, i'm i don't want to sound glib here and i know this is something we're all aware of but um so often i see that this really powerful principle in journalism which i do not blame journalists for at all but quite the opposite in my family, journalists are just just sacred. Um, but there is a really strong tendency in our psychology and in the way our media is, tends to be set up. I don't mean to generalize about the whole thing, but the, the line for me is that bad news is loud. Bad news is really, really loud. And I think this is really relevant to what we're talking about today because it's that whole thing about Shelley saying that the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, or Ezra Pound saying, you know, people don't read poetry, but every day people die because for lack of what's in poetry. Those green shoots are always there. And in fact, one of the one of the whole challenges of being human is that the moment we most want to see this coming change that we need, it is most invisible to us. I, I like, this sounds fancy ass, I don't mean it that way, but I like thinking of this whole thing WB8 said about the gyres, you know, the gyres like a, like a cone, like a vortex. And one age is dominated by a certain image, like the dynamo, like Todd brought up. And, and that image, it starts broad and it gets closer and closer and closer. And at the end, when that age is about to end, there's a shifting to the next gyre, right? And now that's oversimplifies and it's kind of Hegelian, you know, it's like thesis, antithesis, all that stuff. But the, I, I'm one of the most amazing things about Trump for me is, and I'm still, I mean, the, I may have said this last time I talked, the number that fills my nightmares is 74 million because it's it's bad enough again i'm not people may have different political views i don't mean to push mine on anybody but it was bad enough that millions of people voted for trump the first time when a lot of us saw him coming 10 effing miles 10,000 effing miles off we saw him coming we knew what it was going to be like but that 74 million people could vote for him after seeing him for four years that that hurts and fills me with fear and yet I think any objective view of what's happened to America during the Trump years has got to look at the response to Trump. The left, the liberal left has never been galvanized in my lifetime, uh, with the possible exception of the 60s, but it's never been galvanized to this level that it is today. And we actually know that the, the country is tending to shift to the left anyway. Now, like Todd said, we don't know, we don't know how this is gonna end up, but it, there, there is kind of a tendency, like no child labor anymore, right? It's not okay to be a racist anymore, even though some people are trying to act like it's okay to be a racist. And my point is that story just represents coming out in comic books, coming out in kids' movies, coming out in serious art. It represents all of those impulses in us that are trying to push their way up out of the ground into those green shoots. So I think I, I just try to remind myself that they're there, even if I can't see them. I mean, that's... Well, it's funny. It's funny because, and maybe this is a good thing to end on. Um, and remember next the next episode is going to be visions of the future we're going to talk about that but this morning i was thinking about i was laughing and telling my husband about that picture of kamala harris marching in the um the gay pride parade 
and how hilarious it was because you could really tell who was the secret service guy because he was right next to her, but he had like a Hawaiian shirt on, but he had that haircut and he was like this, he was like a, he was like, you know, Mr. Munster, but with a, he was trying to blend in and how funny that was. And then I thought, well, that's amazing. Our vice president is a black Asian American. I mean, and she had the Secret Service there in a Hawaiian shirt on a gay pride parade. Oh my God, that never would have happened when I was a kid. Yeah. And yet we just accepted it. You know, That's we're right. just we're just moving forward. So um, that is a green shoot, I have got that to say. That is a green shoot. So I, I think it's seven o'clock. So it I want is. to thank, yeah. So I want to thank Catherine again. I want to thank everybody. And David, I'm sorry we didn't get to hear from you. And Kristen, I'm so glad to see you. Hi. Um, but. And Colby, you have to come next time because we'll talk about audiobooks and how they're part of the future of visionary fiction. And Mike, thank you so much for coming. And maybe you could come next time too. That would be great. And Catherine, thank you for coming as well. Well, thank um, you for being here. This has been wonderful. So um, good night, everybody. And I hope everybody has something nice to eat and drink until we see each other again. All right. Bye. 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 All right.